30 to 40 minutes, probably. Hey, everybody. How are you? Welcome back to the uh, Success Secrets Revealed live stream show with Ronald Coming, your host. And uh, today we we are blessed to have with us uh, Steve Sims. He's the CEO and founder of Bluefish. And I'm going to talk to you about his bio in a second. But first, I want to tell you the purpose of this show, Success Secrets Revealed. I'll introduce our sponsor, and then we're going to bring Steve on, okay? So the purpose of this show, Success Secrets Revealed, is basically I wanted to create this show. I have a radio show, Internet Marketing and Business Solutions with Ronald Coming. But because of this COVID stuff, they're not manning the station, so they're just running reruns. So I still wanted to contribute and, and give value to people. And I've been blessed because I've been speaking across the country for years on different aspects. And I've met some amazing people, much like today's guest, Steve uh, Sims. And you'll understand why in a little bit. But what I wanted to do, I created this show to bring on business owners, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders, people who have already been there and done that factually, not just read books or, you know, uh, took a test and all of a sudden, you know, they're an expert, right? Uh, so, and, and they're going to come on and they're going to talk about how they did what they did. And the theory and the hope is that in hearing them, you'll see that A, what you want to do is possible, B, if you hit a roadblock, that other people hit those roadblocks too. So it kind of takes away that isolation. And then also how they got out of it, which is huge because, you know, ultimately we, we all have success and failure. Uh, but, you know, how we, you know, get beyond the failure and continue with the success kind of like sets us apart. So uh, our host today is... Um, RCS Online Solutions, that's my company, and that's where we basically help business owners and entrepreneurs attract, convert, and retain their ideal customers and clients to achieve even greater success using uh, various internet marketing techniques and methods. Let's be honest, at the end of the day, you can have the best service, the best product, the best copy, the best website, the best funnels, you can have the best of everything, but if your ideal customer and client can't find you when they need your solution, and they're searching for your solution. They're not searching for your name because they don't know you. You know, you're not going to be considered and you're certainly not going to be hired. So anyhow, that's what RCS Online Solutions does. Now, let's get on with the good stuff. So today we're going to introduce you and we're going to learn from Steve Sims. I heard him speak at uh, Secret Knock with Greg Reed, an, an, an amazing event. Greg Reed is an amazing event. I love his book, Three Feet from Gold with Sharon Lecter. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend Secret Knock. Uh, and I've met some amazing people while I was there again today, Steve uh, Steve Sims is one of those people. He is the CEO and founder of Bluefish. And um, that is, uh, let me ask you this question. Do you know anyone that has worked with Sir Elton John or Elon Musk, uh, sent people down to see the wreck of the Titanic or seabed or closed museums into closed museums in Florence or a private dinner party and then had Andrea Buccelli serenade them while they ate pasta? you do now. Quoted as the real life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine, Steve Sims is a best-selling author with Blue Fishing, the art of making things happen, sought after coach and speaker at a variety of networking groups and associations as well as the Pentagon, and we're probably going to touch on that, and Harvard twice. Uh, so Steve, how are you today, brother? I'm doing all right, thanks. Thanks for having me. I now you know right uh you know I tis a fine day are you from across the pond mate yeah <laughs> I love it when people do the accents uh yeah I'm over I'm a London boy that's now living over here in Los Angeles excellent wow so you went from London not even east coast you're all the way over on the west coast oh I went the long way round I went from London to Hong Kong Bangkok uh Palm Beach and then Los Angeles so I did a I did a full circle Excellent. Uh, but that also just adds to the uh, experiences that you bring to the table because you've just been so many places and seen mo so many things that people like myself have only seen on TV and in movies. So um, uh, tell us a little bit more. I saw you at uh, Greg Reed's event, Secret Knock, and it was phenomenal. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Wow. Um, all right. Well, I'll try and keep it, uh, keep it easy for you. 
Um, I'm a school dropout, left school at the age of 15, ended up working on my father's building site. Um, like all entrepreneurs, I knew where I didn't fit. Um, and as a young lad from East London, I was trying to find out where I could fit. So I bounced off the walls, tons of jobs, tons of bad uh, decisions, tried to get into so many bad things. Um, not bad as an illegal, just try to find jobs that I thought would work for me, but didn't and just did nothing more than discourage me and upset me. Uh, eventually, I decided to run away from the country. So I got a job in Hong Kong um, when I was in London. And they flew me out to Hong Kong. I lasted one day. I was fired and ended up working on the door of a nightclub uh, just to get some money. From there, believe it or not, that what could have been considered as a low point was probably one of the pivotal moments of my life. You see, from working on the door of a nightclub, I got to observe people, what they saw value in, how they looked, how they dressed, how they spoke, how they handled each other, how they related to people. And it was a great way of just being a voyeur in the social scene. So from there, I decided that sticking with the basic cliche of you are the five people that you know, I realized that all of the five people I knew were broke. Guess what? Broke people don't buy things they can't afford you. So I went out on a mission to find five affluent friends. And the only way that I could do it at the time was to give them suggestions on the best nightclubs, the best parties to go to. And from there, I went from recommending the best nightclubs to getting them into premieres. And then I started throwing parties um, to capture even more clients. I took over penthouses, mansions, yachts. I'm now flying around the planet doing these amazing events. And then I ended up working and partnering with people like Sir Elton John, the Grammys, Kentucky Derby, uh, the New York Fashion Week, Formula One, Monaco. So literally over a 25 year period, went from working on the door to partnering with some of the biggest events in the planet and only working with millionaires and billionaires. So I was the man that people came to when they had a small little dream, like I want to go down to the Titanic or, you know, I want to take over, I want a good meal in, in Italy. So I took over the uh, Museum Academia, uh, the Galleria de Academia in Florence and set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. And then, as you said, had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them while they're eating the pasta. Um, I was the guy that basically did the impossible and gave them their greatest dreams. It was a cool time. Um, and then, of course, the, the funny thing was no one knew who I was until about three, about two and a half years ago when I released a book through Simon Schuster and it kind of propelled me into uh, the public life. I love it. But, you know, this history is amazing. What you've just talked about, I started to take notes and, and then I found myself sitting here going, wow, right? So uh, <laughs> so I just want to um, touch on a few things. But, you know, before we get into like the specifics, you know, what I'd like to talk about is the overall vision. I mean, you, you know, we see people when we go to nightclubs or we go to bar rooms or restaurants and people are checking our IDs and making sure people are you know, of age and not drunk or going to cause trouble. And we think of them as kind of like a, a doorman or a bouncer, right? But that's kind of like where you started, but you had a vision and you sat there and you saw people, you saw what they wanted, you saw how they behaved, you saw, you know, different things. And from what you saw, you went on to create you know, such a world that most people, you know, can't even comprehend. And not only did you create that world, you then provided that world, made money from that world by, you know, creating it and, and, and delivering it for other people. Brother, your vision is like, I don't even, I'm sure other people have told you this, but it's like, wow. I mean, not just what you've done, but you know, just the fact that you sat back and you saw it and then you created it. I mean, you are the perfect entrepreneur. I mean, how did you go from, you know, checking IDs, making sure people were, were of age and, you know, if somebody got too drunk, throwing them out the back door to, you know, sitting with Sir Elton John and Elon Musk. I mean, that is like scaling heights that most people can't even comprehend. I mean, the closest we're going to get is to look at a YouTube video. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, brother? 
I think the uh, you're being very nice to me and you're giving me a great deal of compliments, but uh, I'm not quite sure I deserve them. Uh, the bottom line of it is, I don't think I don't think I've ever overthink things in my life. If you spoke to Greg, he would tell you Steve doesn't think he spends time doing. Um, and my wife actually says my superpower is the power of ignorance. Um, I have a little target and I go for that target. And then I have another target and I go for that target. I didn't wake up one day when I was on the door because you're right. The doorman, no one ever wants to talk to the doorman. So it wasn't a case of, hey, I, would, I had control because the guy next to me that had the guest list, he was getting everyone flirt with him. When they looked at me, they were petrified. You know, they, they didn't want to have a conversation with me. So it wasn't that interaction. It was the fact that I was almost <laughs> an invisible pillar where people, where I could just watch the world, yeah. and see how they related to other people. In fact, when I would walk up to someone and I wanted to start a conversation with them, they would look at me terrified because they thought I was going to punch them in the nose and kick them out of the club. And I'd walk up to them and I'd go, hey, guys, you having a good night? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, what have we done? Well, what have we done wrong? What's, what's wrong? And I'd be like, nothing, nothing. I just, you seem like you're having a good bit of fun and I just want to say hi, just enjoy yourself. None of the doormen ever did that. All the doormen ever did was walk around the room looking scary. Um, and this created almost like a bad vibe. If people were like having a lot of fun, then a doorman came up behind them, they'd be like, oh, we got to calm it down. I was completely the opposite. I was almost the, I was almost the host, even though I was the doorman, I was going around to the people that I wanted to communicate with because, again, I had a simple goal, one simple goal. I wanted to know a rich person, and I wanted to ask them, why are you rich and I'm not? I love that it. was my simple, stupid goal. And the only reason that they would talk to me was if I gave them something. So what I was giving them was I was like, hey, guys, I see you here every Tuesday. Next Thursday, there's a really good party down the road. Would you like me to see if I can get you into it? It gave them a reason to talk to me. Now, here's the funny thing. I've never been shy about asking for anything, but I never, ever, ever, ever got around to asking them how they made so much money. Because by the time I started doing what I was doing to keep them in my circle, then I created an industry. I was already making the money. So I never, ever got around to asking these people how they made so much money. Yeah, um, I, I love, you know, what you do is was so fundamental. And, and I, you know, you talk about it in like an abstract. And I don't think you even really at this point, you probably do. But at that point, you didn't. But you added value first. You went up to them instead of asking them. These were successful people. These were people in there having fun. They had money. And instead of asking them for something, instead of trying to sell them something, you added value first. You saw what they liked. You saw how they interacted. And you said, hey, I know that there's a party down the street somewhere in a week or two weeks. I can get you in there. You added value first. That brought them into your sphere. And then from there, you were able to, you know, capitalize on that. But you did it by adding value first. I mean, these are things that we learn, but, you know, you learned on like an intuitive level. I mean, you just did it. You know, we go to seminars, we pay for coaches and we do all this. And you just kind of like learned it on uh, in intuitive. So once you saw these people and you met these people, you referred them to these type of parties. How did that grow to getting to a point where you had enough credibility to have um, Mr. Budicelli, if, and, and I'm I'm probably not pronouncing his name correctly, to serenade some of your guests in Italy to, you know, sit down and or even talk with Sir Elton John and Elon Musk. I mean, you know, he's got a lot of things going on, but as a visionary, I just love people like him because he is like so far out there. I mean, his interpersonal communication skills might be lacking and that's because he's, you know, he's really not like one of us. He's like, you know, five, 10, 15 levels above us. So to actually have his attention and communicate with him is just like huge, brother. So can you tell us how, you know, you went from all these different steps? I mean, it's huge. Well, it's, it's, it's easy. 
which is the the answer you don't want to hear. But no one walks onto a ladder. Uh, sorry, no one walks onto the roof. They get there by walking up the ladder. So as I was getting people into parties and building up my roller decks, and I literally used to have a little roller decks, and then I had something called a Franklin that would be all my thing. Then I got a Palm Pilot. But I would build up all of my roller decks of all of the people that I was looking after, and I would make notes about what I'd get them in. I would cross-reference it very simply. And then it got to a point where I was getting so many people into events that I used to go to clubs that had like week nights. Like for I'm saying, a Tuesday night at a nightclub is usually quiet. But if you've already got like 200 people, you can make that Tuesday night really, really good because it's the people in the event that make the event, not the event. So I started throwing my own parties. And then from there, the parties got bigger. And then what I did arrogantly and this is this is the trait of an entrepreneur an entrepreneur we're never satisfied you know if we make a hundred thousand dollars we're like hey great i want 150 and that's we just that's like five minutes later once we realize we made the hundred k it's like yeah. well, okay but you know i could have made more what did i do wrong <laughs> exactly so the, the <laughs> stories that i'm giving are no different to you to greg to anybody else the point was I never wanted to settle. Now, there were two things that I never wanted to settle on. One of them was my growth. Now, if you do what you do every single day, as the world moves, you're actually going backwards. It's like if you took all of your money, stuck it in a suitcase, and you've got $100,000, and you stick it in a suitcase, and you buried out 100 grand in the oh, in rear what? garden. I never. You know, in, in five years' time, You've still got your hundred grand in the suitcase, but now it hasn't kept up with inflation and it's gone backwards. That's the exact same with us. If what we do today is the exact same thing that we do tomorrow, the following day, there's no growth. We've got to keep up with our inflation. We've got to keep up with uh, the intelligence and the growth. So I constantly tried to find things that would make me feel uncomfortable. And so if we're in a party, and there's some really smart people over here, but there's a genius over here. I'm going to go and try and have a conversation with the genius. I would always try and push myself. So once my parties were really good, once the people that I had come into these parties that were now paying me one to $5,000 just to get into my party, then what I was doing was I was going to other people's parties the New York Fashion Week, the Kentucky Derby. I was going to these events and I was going, how do you run your event? And I'm noticing, and you say about the value, I would say to them, I noticed that your ticket, price, your ticket prices, they don't have enough tiers. The value add for the VIPs isn't exciting enough. There's no engagement to get them involved now quick. So there's no kind of, hey, get in quick, but there's no... Uh, initial response and driver to get so I was giving these comments to some of the largest events in the world, and a lot of them were saying to me, Well, who the hell are you? Um, I, I won't mention the name, but there was one company out of the lineup that I've mentioned to you before, one major international event that actually said to me, Who are you to be able to tell us how to do our event? And then the next year, I got the uh, the New York Fashion Week. And then the next week, uh, the next year I got, I think it was um, uh, the Palm Beach Art Fair and Bridgehampton Polo. And then I was involved with uh, the 2004 Grammys. The following year, this company came back to me and went, oh, hang on a minute. Maybe we should listen to you now. <laughs> and so, it, Was it the same person? It, was, it wasn't the same person, but it oh. was one of the same team. The person that had said, you know, who should we let? They had left. But the person that was in the meeting came back to me and I ended up working with them. So I've always gone into every single conversation, whether it be as a doorman going to a rich person in a nightclub or whether it being going to the Elton John AIDS Foundation. I've always walked through the front door going, hey, have you thought about doing this to amplify your response? your sales, your marketing, your branding. I've always, as I always like to think to, uh, as I like to think of it, I always bring something cool to the party. Now, here's the thing. If I'm walking into Sir Elton John's Oscar party and I'm walking up to Elton John, you can be guaranteed I want something. 
he can be guaranteed I want something. He either wants, you know, I want a selfie. I want to sell him a product. You know, he can be guaranteed that if someone's walking up to him, just like he, not just like anyone with profile, if someone's walking up to them, that person is thinking, what does this person want? They never expect you to turn up and go, hey, how you doing? I know you're doing this, but have you thought about this? Because I saw this problem and here's the solution. And here's the funny thing. I've walked up to very powerful people and I've said, hey, I noticed you're involved in this. I couldn't help noticing there were three mistakes you were making. But if you did this one thing, it would remove those mistakes. And I remember very, uh, very vividly walking up to someone very powerful and saying this to them. And that stood there with a couple of our directors now looking at me kind of like all quizzical. And the guy turned around and said, we discovered that two months ago. And that's why we canceled the program. And I went, oh, okay. They said, but no one's ever come to us with a solution. They've always come to us with an ask. I like the fact that you came to us. And they said to us, they said to me, can we send you what we're working on now and let you have a look at that? And I went, absolutely. People want solvers. They don't want someone shuttling the problem along down, down the line. They want someone with a solution mentality. So whenever you go to anyone, if you want to have a chat with Greg Reed, Give him a reason to have a chat with you. If you want to be on, on, on one old show, give one of the reason to have you on a show. Always think about what you can bring to the party. I love it. And, and that goes back to like kind of like we talked about adding value first. But what you did is you probably, you know, we can talk. And, and I think it's um, Jim Rohn and, and, and probably several other people. They talk about how we will be compensated and rewarded for the problems we we solve in the future. If we're solving a problem like how to put um, groceries in a bag, we will be compensated, you know, accordingly. And there's, you know, that's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting anybody down. But the bigger problems you solve, the bigger solutions you bring to the table, you know, the more not only you're going to make, but the more value that you bring the marketplace. And that's what you did. You're right. You know, people are so used to whether it's, you know, Sir Elton John or, you know, Les Brown, Greg Reed, you know, all these other people, Mark Victor Hansen, anybody you can think of, people are coming up to them to take can I get that selfie? Can I, you know, can I interview you? Can I give you my, you know, manuscript? Can, you know, will you read my thing so you can produce my movie? Whatever it is, but to come up to them and not just tell them what's wrong, but to offer them that solution. To yeah. give them the solution to the problem sets you apart. Anybody can be a critic. Anybody can say, I don't like that. You could do that better. Uh, this was wrong. This didn't make me feel comfortable. All that, you know, that's great. But, you know, I don't you know, want to be politically incorrect here, but it's kind of crap, right? Tell me that, but then put a comma on it, not a period, and tell me how I can solve the problem. And pow, you and I will connect. I love that, brother. Tell me more. Even if your solution sucks, even if the solution is one that they've already come up with, the fact that you walk into a party with a different mindset gets their attention. When you actually, you know, the old saying about, oh, I need to get my foot in the door. With social networks, we can communicate with anyone. We could tweet to Donald Trump. We could tweet to Elon Musk within the next two seconds. If you made it interesting, compelling, and valuable enough, you'll probably get a response. We've never, ever been in a situation where we can reach absolutely anybody. The downside is whenever anyone's contacting someone, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're like, hey, could you help me out with this? Can you do this for me? Will you work? That doesn't work. No one wants to go down to one side. It's got to be a two-way street, and it can only be a two-way street if you lead the charge in that benefit first. I love it, man. I love it. That's so huge. And I also like how you, I, I actually wrote it down and, you know, I will try my best to say I heard it from you and that will probably work three or four times. And then I'm just going to forget that. But no one walked onto a roof. They climbed a ladder first. So they climbed a ladder to get there. I don't remember exactly how you phrased it. But, you know, we all know, you know, it's a stepping stone. Every time we see somebody who's super successful today, 
that's five, seven, 10, 15, 20 years in the making. You see them today, but you know, that wasn't how they got there. That's where they're at now. Yep. So, uh, so, you know, you don't get to that top of the roof. You have to climb that ladder and that ladder has steps, right? So uh, I, I love that quote, man. And I will definitely paraphrase that. And like I said, I'm going to, you know, give you a hundred percent credit three, four, right. five times. And <laughs> then I might forget where I heard it. It's not personal. It's old age. You know, I look a lot younger than I really am, but <laughs> you know, right. I'm, I'm okay. closing in on 60 quicker than I'd like to admit. Right. And, um, but that's huge. I like it, and, but it's just so real and it's just so fundamental and it's so authentic. Um, if I could ask you, what are like, if somebody's going to start a business, they have a business, uh, and they want to either grow, um, launch or scale a business. What are like three tips that a business owner or an entrepreneur could, you know, could possibly use, you know, and it could be, you know, multiple levels. It could be somebody just starting, somebody who's been in business for five years and it might, you know, apply to all of them. But what are like, you know, three tips that a business owner or an entrepreneur can use to either launch, scale or grow their business? All right, easy. And it doesn't matter where you are in that chain. But the first one is vital. What problem are you solving? That's, that's the key. What problem are you solving? So whatever you do has to, has to complement the issue. So first of all, identify that. You'll be amazed at how many people that I coach, and I coach quite a lot of clients, that actually come to me and they go, oh, I do this. And I say to them, okay, Who's your client? Well, anyone that can afford it. No, we need to identify a problem because why? People will do anything to remove a problem. If I give you the choice here of running out the door uh, because there's a, a suitcase there of a million dollars, you may not trust it. You'll be suspicious. You won't go there. But if I say to you, go out this door because there's a fire, you'll run from the pain. You'll run from a problem. So what is the solution that your business can solve? That's, that's the first thing. Second thing is, is the message that you're uh, amplifying, is the message that you are sending out clear to solve that problem? One of the best advertising campaigns in the world was tense nervous headache, take Advil. You know, the other one was um, have a Coke, have a smile. You know, it was giving you a situation and it was giving you a result. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. What you've got to be able to do is to make sure that you don't have 10 pages of windy message. You say, hey, have you ever wanted to do this? Then you're in the right place. So you want to identify what the problem is that you are the solution for. You want to amplify your message to make sure that it's clear. And thirdly, on any platform you're on, you need to echo the same message. For some stupid reason, people on LinkedIn are all smart and pompous in a suit. And they get over to Facebook and this girl's gone wild. They change that personality on different platforms. That's bullshit. Don't do that. The bottom line of it is Nike, Apple, any other company in the planet is exactly the same on every single social platform it is on. So be have continuity in who you are, the message you're sending out, and make sure that you are very, uh, are very um, um, strong very obvious and impossible to misunderstand as to what you solve. Those are my three. I love it. And uh, do you know Dan Fleischman from uh, like he started? Who's your well, boy Dan? Yeah, we go back. Oh, he's a great guy. And one of the things that that I've listened to him at multiple events was uh, he talks about as simple as like what you talked about on your third point. He talked about being consistent on all your platforms to the point of even having your picture the same on all platforms. Yep. So when everybody sees your platform, they automatically, you know, go to you and think of you. And if they see one on Facebook, one picture, one profile picture on all these different platforms, whenever they see it, they're not connecting to you. You need to connect it. So I, I loved your third point, but you also talked about like, you know, what is the problem you're solving? You've got to be clear. And who are you solving it to? And it's not like me. I, I, I own a um, digital marketing company. I help technically any business owner or an entrepreneur, but that's really not true. You know what I mean? Because they all can use it, but there are certain things that kind of like, 
you know, I don't want to say weed out, but, you know, so identifying who is your ideal customer or client, who you can actually connect with, who is a fit for you in the problem you solve for them. And I love the ideology, serve, don't sell. Because at the end of the day, when you're serving and you're not selling, you know, it's not just about that interaction with that individual because it's going to transcend that because that individual will then become your best, you know, marketing piece. You know what I mean? So it's to me, it's all about serving, not selling. But I really love, uh, you know, everything you, you had to say. I want to be respectful of your time. I mean, I, I'm free to go for another half hour, uh, but, you know, I told you 30, 40 minutes tops. We've just passed 30 minutes. So I just want to ask you, uh, you know, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you would like to cover, uh, um, and, and I want to make sure we, we cover that before, you know, we just maybe start talking about, uh, you know, the tube or anything else. And, and your tube in here in the U.S., when we talk about the tube, we're talking about TV. In your country, we when we talk about the right. tube, yeah. we're talking about the subway, right? In America, we call it the subway. Some people call it the underground or the tube. I mean, it's it, you know, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to stay professional. You know what I mean? I gotta tighten my shirt, make sure there's no wrinkles, brother. I think today you need to look at it as an opportunity. Um, we are living in a world of distortion, distraction, chaos, only because we don't know. If you suddenly got a text today going, hey, everything is solved next Wednesday, you're chill because you'd have a definite date. You'd have an end zone. But we're living in a world of unknown, and it's rattling us. Now, the funny thing is, as entrepreneurs, we live in a state of unknown every single day of our life because we're constantly trying to push the envelope. We're constantly trying to find out what can be done. So we've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Today, more people want to know things. More people are at home. More people are looking at the internet. More people are dreaming of what they're going to do once this is all done. Why are you therefore not marketing 10 times harder today? Because I tell you, in a month's time, they ain't going to be looking at you because they're going to be in the malls. They're going to be in the restaurants. They're going to be in the bars. They're going to be on a plane on holiday. Today is the day that you can amplify your message to 10 times more people. So today is a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity. And I know I'm personally benefiting from it. You should be doing the same. I love it. And, you know, when we talk about like everything that's going on, what you know, I, I fully agree with what you talked about. And it goes back to a very basic couple of basic points. Did it happen to me? Or did it happen for me? Yep. Sean Stevenson, yep. Exactly. When I get up in the morning, do I have to go to the gym? Do I have to get up? Do I have to get dressed? Do I have to go 2.2 miles to the gym? Do I have to, have to, have to? Because that place is a negative. If I turn that around and come back to, well, if I stay in bed... If I take, you know, I don't, you know, it's kind of like when you're in a room and they teach you the NLP stuff and you're, you're speaking, you anchor it over here opposed to over here. But, you know, if you turn that negative around to like, well, if I stay in bed, you know what I mean? My immune system's going to decrease. I'm going to gain weight. I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to feel, you know, sexy. I'm not going to be attractive. I'm not going to get girl. Whatever it is, you know what I mean? I'm not going to feel... You know, I, I just, you know, it's really, you know, when you're starting to talk about really about mindset stuff. So at the end of the day, you know, we're kind of going, you know, up until this point, we've kind of talked about um, how we prefer perform and what we do and, and the successes we've had. But it really comes down to like the mindset stuff. So uh, I can't let you go, brother, until you start to tell us a little bit about that mindset what set you apart and i don't want to say from the average doorman because there is absolutely nothing wrong with him my brother georgie is one and he might be listening and i'm telling you if you looked if you saw a picture of my brother minus the fu manchu you and him would be pretty uh identical i don't know your side you know from from this view but he's like um 
I don't know, you know, six feet something and, you know, 300 pounds and, and all that stuff. And he drives a bike, one of the nicest people in the world. But if you look at him, it's like, hi, you know what I mean? But, uh, but what was the mindset that got you from being, you know, a doorman? And again, I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's just, you know, it's, it's that role. It's that function. But you saw that you, you just went from that to, you know, sitting down with Elton John, sitting down with Elon Musk, arranging tables with Anatoly Bucelli, right? And, and people eating pasta in Italy. Dude, I mean, this is like, you know, who is that guy on, on PBS? Um, Robin something or other. And he, he, he had, you know what I'm talking about? And he had this travel show, right? I mean, you're like, he went there and, and you know other people paid him to go but i mean you lived it this guy was like on the outskirts of it you were on the inside i think the mindset is what we've already defined within the entrepreneur the entrepreneur doesn't want to settle in fact nine times out of ten when they start getting into monotony they usually screw things up so we're inventors designers visionaries so i literally just I was the little Irish kid that didn't want to settle. You know, if I made, if I made 10 grand, I wanted to make 20. You know, if I had a nice apartment, I wanted the penthouse. If I had a nice house, I wanted an estate. If I had a nice garden, I wanted to have a view of the ocean. You never settle. Um, and entrepreneurs, we have that in us. Uh, if we don't, then we're just kidding ourselves. But I found that I got more benefit from trying things and failing than by not trying at all. And I would fail 20 times and then I would be successful once. And that once would propel me into another galaxy, into another stratosphere, into another sand pit. And then I'd be, oh, I like it here. Now that I'm here, where else can I go? Right, I'm going to see if I can get into that sand pit. So it's this constant demand of yourself never to settle. And that's what it was for me. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I was just listening. I mean, actually, I have it right here behind me, uh, 10X, Grant Cardone. And uh, I've done, you know, a dozen of his programs and like 50 other people. And I, you know, I sit down to dinner with a whole bunch of these people, right? So, but I still contribute. I pay, you know what I mean? You pay up, you show up, you blow up, right? As Carlos talks about, right? I mean, he coined that phrase, but, you know, the ideology behind it is, you know, we all know it, but, you know, he talks about that and, and, and I just, you know, I, I love that mentality, brother. And it's kind of like if somebody tells you, I recently had someone tell me, you know, I made like, I don't know, like $8,000 on, on a particular thing, but it, it literally could have been like 15, 16, 18 or 20. And, you know, I was like, damn, you know, uh, what did I do wrong that I didn't present the value? You know what I mean? Well, you know, these people could have, you know, it wasn't about what they gave me because then I got to pay other people. I got to pay taxes. You, you know, as an entrepreneur, we get 10 grand at the end of the day. We're lucky if we get like 2,100 of that, right? Because, you know, we got to pay for the product, the service, the, you know, the platforms we pay for, the advertising, the taxes, the people who work for us. So, you know, 10 grand really best means like 2100 to us so when you talk about eight grand you know you so it's not really about the money it's about you know i could have helped that person more and you know what was it about me that i wasn't able in that conversation to convey the value that i could have provided them and you know how that would have helped their lives and this person said to me be grateful for what you have. And I just sat there and I was dumbfounded. And I was like, I don't even know you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, do you know me? What do you mean be grateful for what I have? I mean, you know, I'm never going to go without food. Great, you know, because, you know, I, I, I've created that. I was born in the projects. You know, I mean, I grew up on WIC. You know, I was on welfare. My mother was a drug addict and an alcoholic. My father went to prison when I was three. You know what I mean? I have every excuse in the world not to fail. But I just sat there. And when she said that to me, it kind of like 
you know, took the wind out of my sail because I agree with you so much. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, we're, it, it's not so much that we're never happy. It's just so much that we know that we have so much more to contribute to the world. We have so much more to serve. And uh, when we don't convey that, it's, it's more about us and our failure. It's not about what we can do and what we can provide, but it's about our failure and how we didn't let the other person know about it. Am I correct? Yep. So that's my sermon, brother. <laughs> I told you this was about you. Somehow I just hijacked it for about nine. There you go. Yeah, it's your show. Do what you like. I'm sorry. But, you know, I'm telling you that has rented space and you just hit a nerve because it rented space in my head. I'm like, what do you mean be happy? I mean, you know, I could have done so much more for this person. It wasn't about the money because at best I'm going to make 18 cents on every dollar. You know what I mean? So it's never about the money. You know, it, it, it's about providing that service is about, you know, helping them. And, and, you know, if I, it, what means more to me than that 18, 21 cents on the dollar, give me a testimonial video. Tell me that I helped you. You know, if you go out, I have clients, you know, Ron Adams, I, you know, I can name them and he's made, you know, three, four, five million bucks, right? To me, that's huge. You know what I mean? And so, you know, how that's helped him and the people he's helped, you know, that means more than the pennies they paid me because, you know, by default, everybody that we help and they help, we helped, right? So, um, you know, anyhow, that's my little story. All right, well, this has been fun. Uh, I've enjoyed it and I hope it helps the people. Yeah, it does. Now, Steve, tell me, man, if somebody wanted, I mean, obviously we have your stuff scrolling down here. If somebody wanted to sit down with Sir Elton John, I mean, who, who are you working with now? How can somebody, you know, obviously your contact information is there, but me, if I wanted to go to the Grammys, if I wanted to sit down with Elton John, if I, anybody, how can we make that happen? Wow. We well, need to give them a reason. There's a couple of ways of doing it. One, you need to join a really good concierge firm. Um, they could help you. Um, Isn't that what you do right now? What What are you doing? Is, now? But we have we have. I have two organisations. I have Bluefish. Well, I have three. I have Bluefish, which is a high end concierge firm, and we're maxed out on clients there, so we can't take on any more clients there. I have a smaller company called Taste of Blue, which is an emerging uh, company which is just starting. Uh, Tasteofblue.com. You can find details on there about that. But the real focus for me, because I've moved away from the travel industry, is on the coaching and the branding and the marketing and the speaking under Steve D. Sims. So I do have a program called Sims Distillery, which actually trains people on how to communicate, how to brand, how to market, how to live their life. And also it gets me twice a month. So if you have questions and you want to ask me, the cheapest, easiest, fastest way is to join simsdistillery.com and to be part of one of our live AMAs twice a month. I love it. Now, Steve, did you ever serve in, 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 in the United States? How long have you been in the United States? Since 2000. Did you ever serve? I mean, uh, all right. So since 2000, and um, that's excellent, man. And that's like 20 years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you paused for that. You actually paused. We're in 2020, and I told you I got her into You had to wait for that answer? Well, for two reasons. One, because I thought something else, and I didn't know if I should open that door. But, um, you know, it's 100% positive, but I didn't know. But, um, you know, so that is 20 years, but the accent kind of, like, threw me as well. Yeah, it's still there a bit, I'm afraid. Yeah, are you from across the pond, mate? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I, I, mean, I love it. You know, years ago, uh, I've been doing online marketing for people now, but years ago, I used to do a lot of managed services and we would work with companies like banks and do their securities and people would call in and simple things like they forgot their password or whatever. But I'd have people from Germany, from England, and depending upon the time of day, from Brazil and India, and they would literally, because I work for uh, DB Bank, right, do 
do Beecher or, or do Shebang, but they just told us to play DB, right? And um, uh, because they didn't want people to say douche, right? <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so um, they would call in from around the world, and I used to just joke with them, hey, you from across the pond, mate. And usually when they called us, they were kind of like stressed out because things, you know, didn't work out for a half hour, and then finally they called tech support, right? But uh, so anyhow, uh, you know, I digress. You know, I, the accent threw me, brother. I, I, I love to stay professional and stuff, but sometimes my real personality comes out. All I want to do is make money, serve people, and have fun, right? So, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I want to live on the beach, and I don't, uh, you know, corporate America has never been a thing that has called me. It's kind of like something that repels me. So uh, being politically correct or, you know, being, you know, uh, that's just not me. <laughs> you know what I mean, sometimes my personality shines when I, uh, but you've been a great guest and um, you provided so much value. And I'm telling you, you, you really, you know, when we see people, we, we, we go to restaurants and we see a hostess, right? And, and you know, she's taking our numbers or he, you know, she or he is, is taking our requests and they're seeing us. We have no idea who they are or what their history is, right? Or, no. or what their future will be. I mean, they're sitting there. I mean, you know, when I go in there, you know, we see them and we, we think of it as like a... I don't even know if it's a correct word, but like perfunctionary, but it's just like we go in, we give them our name, we tell them our table, we tell them our time, and they tell us where we're going to go. And they look on a little map and they see what, you know, where they're going to put us. But those people can then, like you did, look at us, see how we dress, how we talk, what's important to us, what isn't important to us, ask us a couple of questions, and from there, be sitting down with billionaires and people like, you know, Elon Musk and uh, Elton John and some other people. But anyhow, uh, you've been a great guest. Is there anything in closing you'd like to add? No, I think we've done everything. We've given people a good snapshot and hopefully invigorated them to do something. I love it. And, and it, it, it really all comes down to, you know, mindset and attitude. It doesn't matter where you are, what you came from. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just about where you want to go and seeing things slightly different. You know what I mean? You know, whatever our circumstances are, you and the 10, 15, 20 doormen that you worked with were the same. You had the same job, the same pay, give or take a few bucks, a few hours, different locations. You know what I mean? So there might have been slight differences. But your mindset set you apart. And that mindset, what you wanted to accomplish, what you saw, how you saw it, set you apart and set you on a path to provide the value, the services and blah, 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 to get you to where you are now. So Steve, I just want to tell you, it, it, it's been, you know, I, when I saw you at Greg Reed's event and you spoke, I mean, it was phenomenal and, and I'm so grateful and thank you for um, being with us today. Cheers, pal. Look after yourself. Hi. Hey, everybody. That was amazing. Steve Sims, uh, you know, uh, maybe my, uh, added uh, dialogue was a little bit long, but uh, you know, Steve, he's a rock star. He's amazing. What he has accomplished uh, just proves that you know it doesn't matter where you are or what you do. It's a matter of mindset and where you want to go, how you see things. It doesn't matter what happens to you. It's about what you know. You can see it as something that happens to you or something that happens for you, and then how you propel and use that going forward. This is Ron Coleman. That's my name. And uh, this is the show is Success Secrets Revealed. The, uh, the sponsor of this show is RCS Online Solutions. And we basically help entrepreneurs and business owners like you construct a message, their websites, their funnels, all that other stuff uh, to create the online presence. Because at the end of the day, you can have the best of everything, but if people can't find you, they can't consider you and they can't hire you, right? So 
RCS Online Solutions. We help business owners and entrepreneurs, much like you, attract, convert, and retain their ideal customers and clients to achieve even greater success. I hope you guys have a great day, and please tune in at uh, 2.30 today. Normally, we do one episode a day, but today at 2.30, we have Scott Sorrell, and he is amazing, amazing. So you've got to tune in, okay? Love you all. Bye for now.